Praise be Jesus Christ, and welcome to Season 11 of CarmelCast. CarmelCast is a production of the Institute of Carmelite Studies Publications. For more information, you can visit our website at www.icspublications.org. And it's a great joy for us to begin this season of, of CarmelCast, where we're going to be talking about St. Teresa of Avila, um, the foundress of the Discalced Carmelites. And this first episode, it's especially um, important because we're releasing it on her feast day. And, and we see her really as we call her our, our Holy Mother because she um, is, it's through her that our, the char- our charism is imparted. And so I thought it would be good for us in this first episode uh, of this seven-part series uh, talking about Teresa of Avila, is this first episode to kind of talk about um, some of the context of which she came into the world and then uh, talk a little bit about her birth and early childhood and, uh, you know, her eventually uh, in- entrance into the Carmelite monastery. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's important to know, too, that we're not necessarily going into each of her writings. You know, we've had certain seasons on her writings, and, and that's very important. But this is to give, like, kind of an overall view of her life and her work, which helps understand, you know, what she teaches and, and the influence she's had. And um, even even her mystical life, I think it kind of helps helps people maybe put that in context and, and understand where she's coming from. Yeah. Well, maybe we can start then by talking about her 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 family of origin and kind of, as I think, you know, we know from our own experience, our, our family of origin plays in a, a significant part in our, especially our early childhood and our upbringing, but something that'll carry on through the rest of our lives. Yeah, definitely. Well, you got to go back for Teresa. I mean, just like for us all, right? You go to her grandparents, great-grandparents, you know, how many things shape us? Um, but Teresa is one of those saints that we know a lot about, you know? Mm-hmm. We have a lot of documentation on her, her family. Um, we have a lot of records that they've unearthed even in the last 50 years, you know, about her background. And so that's, that's one of the benefits of studying Teresa. You can kind of just keep going, you know, it's, it's very deep. And, but one of the things that is kind of, maybe you say is a more recent discovery is that Teresa came from Jewish origins, mm-hmm. you know, and, and there was a lot of, I guess you could say there was a lot of baggage with that in Spain in the 16th century, you know, because um, a lot of Jewish people had converted to Catholicism in order to kind of keep their their status in society, you know? And a lot of people had to leave. We know in 1492, you know, uh, um, many Jews had to leave Spain. Um, but because of that, there was kind of this suspicion that some people maybe had converted but weren't really sincere, you know, and maybe weren't truly Christian. Um, but this was also mixed in with a lot of political stuff and um, in questions about influence and financial issues and all these things that, that made kind of people who had been Jewish and became Christian um, kind of suspected, I guess you could say, and, and even persecuted in different ways. Um, and so, yeah, just knowing that now, Teresa came from that background. You know, her grandparents um, probably became Christian, or maybe her great-grandparents did, but they were considered conversos, those who were kind of new Christians, and, and, and the baggage that that kind of brought with it. Right. Yeah, and I, I think that's significant, that year that you mentioned, 1492. I like... Um, Actually, this this book here, in context by Father Mark O'Keefe, he starts out the book by talking about that year 1492 because you know it's the year we normally know. We learn as kids 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, um, but he mentions two other significant things that happened in Spain during that time. So, I mean, first of all, just how how significant it was of of Columbus's you know um, you know traveling to the New World, but but apart from that was how you know the the Jewish people were expelled from Spain during that time and then in that same year um is when the last of the the Muslim king, kingdoms in Spain was defeated and so really we see this kind of high point of um Christianity in Spain really taking root because it, it you know it's often called like the golden age mm. um in in Spain at that time so you can see how important the faith was but also maybe there is this sense of like um pride in and in, in maybe even in a negative way over mm. others that was that was uh, running through the currents at that time yeah yeah and every great culture you know with all the uh, you know important aspects of it, there's always a shadow side you know yes. and yeah. so even in a culture that's full of faith you could say but there's this shadow side perhaps of intolerance towards you know these even these conversos who were considered christian you know i mean they did yeah. become christian but it was this question of was it sincere are you really christian mm-hmm. you know um 
And, and so, yeah, we just have to kind of take that into account, I think, anytime we're looking at, at that era. Right. And it was really because of that whole background, too. That's why Teresa's family ended up in Avila mm-hmm. to begin with, because they were, you know, uh, her, her grandfather was in, from Toledo. And yet, because of this kind of suspicion around him is why he ended up moving to, to Avila to kind of escape that reputation or bad reputation um, that had found him in, in Toledo. So even like the, yeah, the location of Teresa's birth was affected by yes. these issues. And it affected their livelihood too. And he was a very um, wealthy, you know, cloth merchant and had a lot of business, even with the church, you know, a lot of dioceses and archbishops. Um, but because he had to, you know, they had this kind of amnestice where people who had been secretly practicing their Jewish religion um, kind of had a chance to sort of come public with it and then they wouldn't be persecuted. Um, or, or, or punish, so to speak. But so he did that. But what does it do? Yeah, he didn't get punished, but it took away his reputation. So and, and his merchant business, you know, was really suffering because of that. So, so to go to Avila, it's kind of to start to start afresh. Right. Um, and, and then, you know, met up with other family members who had already gone there. And you can see, and they were like a good Christian family. So they really were sincere in their faith. Um, but it's just this, this part is very helpful to understand, I think, Teresa later on when she talks about questions of honor and people being all obsessed with their lineage and, and using that, you know, to promote themselves. And you can see why she's, she's wary of that kind, those kind of attitudes. Yeah, but it was just so much you know, a part of the culture at that time. And it's something helpful for us to understand in order to, to get where Teresa is coming from, I think. Yeah. So then what about um, Teresa's on, on her mother's side of the family? Is, do we know much about them? Well, we know, we know her name, you know, Beatriz de Ajumado was her mom, that her father Alonzo had married before and his first wife passed away. They had three children together. Um, and so then he met or they were ended up being connected through their families, you know, in connection with the families. And she came from, a, I guess you could say, like a, a traditionally Catholic f- background, you know. Um, and so that was another aspect to kind of help the lineage go forward. Um, and we know that she was a very young woman. She was actually 14 at the time she was married. That wasn't, that wasn't so unusual back then, but you think she was a young woman. And she um, had many children in a very short period of time. And Teresa was number five, um, of those children. And all together though, they had, they had 12, you know? And so Teresa always had a lot of, you know, siblings, people running around the house. Um, but, and she, she looked up to her mom a lot. They had a close relationship and we know that her mom was a, a very, you know, beautiful, um, very graceful filled woman, um, who also suffered a lot because of having a lot of children, the sickness that she had at times. And, um, but you can see there's a great influence between mother and daughter in Teresa. Mm. And it seems like her mother came from a, a fairly felt wealthy family mm. as well, you know, as, as her father did. But of course, you know, we know there's more to the story that there that we, maybe we'll get into uh, about uh, Teresa's father and, and his wealth. But uh, there was, Teresa was growing up in fairly comfortable means in a family that was pretty well established in, yes. in the area. Yes. And, and they, you know, and they were, um, Teresa considered it like she was so blessed to be in that family, you know, that her parents really did give a good Christian witness um, and, you know, provided her with everything. And so she, she was convinced that her parents, you know, were very saintly people. And mm-hmm. Teresa's not one to exaggerate, you know, mm-hmm. so, um, but I think one thing it shows us is that, you know, just the way that God works through kind of difficult situations, you know, and, and again, the shadow side of a Christian culture where um, the different you know, just elements that make life messy, you mm-hmm. know, and that they experience in their backgrounds. Um, and yet how much good is worked through that, mm-hmm. you know? And I think it's, it's just good to remember that even some like a great saint like Teresa, you know, kind of has these complicated elements as part of her family lineage. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, we know Teresa typically as, as Teresa of Avila, but you know, what was her name at birth? The, they, the Spanish names, they combine, you know? So she had Cepeda and Ajumala were part of her names. Yeah. But at that time, you could choose, I, can, I think, is the, the, the kids could choose. So t- Teresa chose from her mother's side to be Teresa de Ajumala, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, had that, yeah, noble lineage of her mom. And, um, but it's interesting, her name, though, there was no saints at that time named Teresa, mm-hmm. um, which, she, which people kind of made fun of her a little bit, right? Poked yes, fun at her about right. that. And I, what, what's the story with that? Well, she claims that it, her name came from Dorothy, mm. and I don't know if that's actually true, <laughs> but for her, that was a connection between, you know, the, a saint there, but 
she received the name of her her, her grandmother, I think, or yeah. some you know some family member that she had received the the name of. Yeah, apparently it was a popular like courtly name for mm-hmm. whatever reason. And, so she um, was even named after kind of like the the honor and the high lineage of of her family. Exactly. But but how much she's laughing now in heaven to see how many saints yes. Teresas there are. Yes. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> and we don't we don't usually hear the uh, of of Saint Dorothy as much as <laughs> as Teresa. So you know, we mentioned you know Teresa. She was born in fifteen fifteen. So again, kind of this really uh, somewhat of a high point as far as Spanish culture goes, and especially Catholic Spanish culture. Um, really, you know, a exciting time as far as the discovery of the new world and all that was going on there, and how that would play a big influence on her family, her brothers in particular. But also, you know, there's a lot going on in the world as far as conflicts and battles that, you know, the, the Spanish were involved in. So um, Teresa would have been aware from a young age of, I think, the reality of the world outside of her just like small context in Avila. She, she knew of what was going on nationally, but even, you know, around the world in some ways. Yes. Well, and Avila was a real central kind of point of travel too, between this, you know, the, the, the Spain was, you know, coming into its own. Avila was a real center spot. So people who were traveling to Toledo, let's say, or other places or Madrid eventually, you know, often they would stop in Avila or Pastor Avila and it had a royal monastery there so that mm-hmm. the kings took particular interest in. And one of their children was is buried, interred in the monastery of Saint, San Tomas in Avila. And I think when, when Teresa was a child, um, there was like this big to-do because the king was passing through and the little baby king <laughs> or future king was like, I think he was, it was like when they started changing him into regular clothes instead of baby clothes, they made this huge thing and they passed through Ava to like celebrate this event. Yeah. So, so, you know, the little child king was there as, and his parents and the whole royal cortege. So yeah, Avila was like a real cosmopolitan area. Mm-hmm. And um, so she would have, you know, and especially with her dad too and his business dealings, he, it's clear that he shared a lot with his children, you mm-hmm. know, having them read and, 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 you know, trying to give them good culture and education. So yeah, for sure, she would have known the, the things in the world going on and right. they were, they're right in the heart of things. Yeah. When well, you've spent a lot more time in Avila than I have, but um, what's striking, you know, there's, there's a church there built you know, on, on the place of, of her birth, her childhood home. Um, they have kind of recreated some aspects of the, the home of Teresa. You can see uh, like what her bedroom might have looked like. And then also there's a little garden area yeah. and you can see that, you know, there's a little statue of young Teresa playing with her brother out mm-hmm. in the garden. So um, it's, 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 it's really cool to just be in that place where Teresa was, you know, growing up as, as a young girl. And uh, I mean, it's a beautiful place, but I, I, there's just around the corner from there, you know, a long walk they had to make to their parish church, you know, mm-hmm. just around the corner uh, was their parish church. And, you know, even today you can see the baptismal font yeah. in the back of the church where Teresa was baptized, you know, probably just within days after her birth. Yes. And actually it's interesting how April 4th, the day, cause she was born on March 28th, right? Mm-hmm. 1515. Um, and April 4th, 2015, <laughs> 1515, um, was the same day that the monastery of the incarnation where Teresa started was inaugurated, at least the new building they had moved and they were kind of coming into their own as a, as a community. And it was inaugurated on that same day. That's the tradition. And yeah. it's eight days after birth. So that in Spain, that was a tradition to have your child baptized eight mm-hmm. days later. And it is neat to see that baptismal font still. Yes. Um, one of the friars in Spain that I got to know at La Santa, he was baptized in that font, you know, wow. so they still use it. And, you know, th- he's very proud of that, right? It's, mm-hmm. um, it's very, it's just cool to see that, yeah, that connection yeah. and how it's still so alive. The memory is still so alive. I mean, the walls themselves, you know, they're the same that Teresa would have seen every day, yes. you know? <laughs> I don't know if you remember seeing this, but in Avila, you know, the young kids, they all, you know, really young, like, you know, toddlers or like, you know, that age, they would all like climb on the rocks yeah. around the wall. And that's where they'd play. And I was laughing because, you know, most, most parents in our country would not, not let their kids play on something that dangerous. They're like <laughs> climbing up on these rocks and, you know, climbing all around. But it was cool for me to imagine like Teresa probably was doing the same exactly. on these same rocks. She would yeah. feel like climbing and climbing around and playing as yeah. a young girl. So definitely. Yeah. So as we mentioned, Teresa's family was pretty devout, you know, her her, both her mother and her father, but I think her, especially her mother seemed to have an impact on her, her at a young age when it came to her faith, kind of introducing her to um, some of the devotions and especially devotion to Our Lady um, and kind of leading, you know, raising her in the faith then. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, they made sure, of course, that, you know, she was prepared for all the sacraments. Um, She was confirmed at seven, you know, which was the time when they did it before, before First Communion. Um, And then she received her First Communion probably around 10. Um, But of course, it was you know, just part of daily life to like raise someone in the faith, you know, it wasn't, she wasn't an unusual, let's say, or, and we don't know anything about those sacraments like we do with like St. Therese, let's say, um, but, but it was just the path, you know, that everyone took, and, but yeah, her mom like really just communicated to her the spirit of gentleness and real deep faith, mm-hmm. you know, you think of having all these children in a very short period of time, um, and even just, you know, being a young teenager when you get married and all that you have to go through and the adjustments and everything, her mom really clung to the Lord and especially to Our Lady uh, through the rosary. Mm. And, and that was her big devotion. And so I'm not sure if that rosary was as universal as it is now, you know, in, in early 16th century. But regardless, it was the rosary that became kind of Teresa's main way of praying. Mm. And, and her mom, like, just made it so clear her love for Our Lady and, yeah. and really passed that love to Our Lady to, to Teresa, which you see much later on especially. Yeah, and you can see how devout the family was just from the fact that even the kids, you know, as they're playing, what are they playing? <laughs> they're, they're playing like very pious sorts of games, you know. Um, they're, they're imagining that they're, uh, you know, hermits and that they're fasting or, that, you know, praying and things like this. So kind of Teresa's mind was, was very filled with these ideas from their, their reading and their discussions in the family of, yeah. of, of what the life of holiness looked like. Yes. Well, and it, it, it's just, again, another testimony to how the faith was just the air that everyone breathed at mm-hmm. that time. I mean, it was just so omnipresent. Um, and like even, I mean, look at the, the famous episode, right, of her going out with Rodrigo, mm-hmm. her, her brother, and this was her favorite brother. brother. And um, the biographers say that one of the reasons, because he did everything that she wanted, you know, <laughs> he was a couple years older, but Therese was so smart. And so she just, you know, so she, he would play all the games that she wanted to play. And, and when they were reading these lies of the saints, you know, because that was what was being read back then. Mm-hmm. And I doubt there were like, you know, you did, nowadays you have like the children's versions where they might, maybe not go into all the gruesome detail of martyrdoms and things, but back then, she was hearing it all, you know, and, and so she hears about these martyrs and it just awoken something in her of like, wow, I want that. Like I want, well, at least I want to go to heaven. You know, you hear about how great heaven is. I want that. And this kind of adventure and this, this, this courageousness. And so she convinced Rodrigo to go off with her, um, to go to wherever they were going to go, where they were going to get <laughs> martyred by, by the Moors or whoever. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, so you can see like those games, just how, how much the faith, yeah, was inculcated in, in their lives through these games they played and just through just the way they thought back mm-hmm. then. Something beautiful there, too, about the, I just reminded me of how in a young child, the, the close connection between, like, the imagination and the games and reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's not so big of a space, perhaps. And so for Teresa, you know, she's reading this, and they're kind of playing a game, but she's also, like, literally running away with her brother, like, leaving the town, and their uncle has to catch them and stop them because they're running away to be martyred. So uh, you just, yeah, it's just, it's the, her, she had these strong imaginings that, that um, she was ready from a young age to put into practice. Yeah, well, they say what, something that struck her from those lives of the saints and that she would repeat over and over to her brother and whoever would listen to her um, was the idea of eternity, mm-hmm. you know, and that forever and ever, you know, that she would always say, siempre, siempre. Mm-hmm. Um, and so even as a young kid, when she's re- hearing these lives of the saints and different things that are being read to her, just this sense of like, the only thing that's worthwhile is what lasts forever. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if these martyrs were willing to go through all these tortures for the sake of heaven, um, then what else, what, yeah, what is this world in a sense, like, what is it going to offer me if it's not something forever and that lasts eternally? And, yes. and so that, it's one of those seeds, you know, that just mm-hmm. planted deep down in her as a little girl and that just continued to blossom as she as she got older. Yeah, and if only we could all kind of revive some of that childlike simplicity of mm-hmm. just like focusing on some something that just seems so important and yeah. being willing to do anything <laughs> for that one thing. You know, there's something really beautiful about that that simplicity in Teresa. Yes. And of course, if we were to like finish the story now and say like that was her childhood, it would seem a very positive upbringing, right? A very mm-hmm. good experience, pious family, raised her in the faith. Um, but of course, we know that's not the end of the story of, of her childhood. Yes. And, and it's, that's one of these, again, very hopeful things about her life is that, you know, you probably, you still have a lot of kids that kind of, 
you see you grow up in a devout Catholic home and you play mass. You know, how many kids have played mass as a kid? You know, it seems like, wow, they're really on a good path and maybe they're going to be a priest one day or something. <laughs> but often that is not necessarily how things unfold. Or at least they have to go through a lot, you know, before, before they can really come into their own in their faith. So, um, so Teresa, too, you know, she has her path that she has to walk and, and probably would have been embarrassed when she's a teenager if someone brought up the fact that she played hermit with her brother, tried yes. to go get martyred, you know, because right. that's not where she was after a few years. Yes. Yeah, I think, and really the first, it seems like the first major um, tragedy that she experienced then was the death of her mother. Mm. And she was you know, maybe 13 years old. Or, uh, I guess we're not sure exactly when her mother died, but probably 13 or 14 years old. Yeah. Um, so certainly old enough to, to really, uh, like, feel the impact, especially having been so close to her mother. Yeah. Um, one thing we didn't mention is she, she her mother um, liked to read a lot of, you know, books, and the, the two of them, as a kind of recreation, would read, you know, not even necessarily like Lives of the Saints, those things too, but also books for entertainment. They would read these books together. So they had a real close bond, mother and daughter, it seems. Yeah, and that, that is an important part to, to point out, is that those, those tales of chivalry, chivalry, you know, which were relatively new at that time, at least being printed, right? Because the printing press hadn't been around that long. Um, so now you had access to all these books that you just didn't have before. So now you could have leisure reading and things like that. Yeah. And so they really did bond together with these books of like knight's tales, chivalry, um, that had like morals built into them, like mm -hmm. good Christian morals, but also some kind of inordinate situations too. And a lot of like, you know, all that, all that comes with those knight's tales, right? Yeah. But oh, romance and, and some like honor and, and pride and beauty and yes, all of those. Yeah, definitely. And, and how, so, so she, she kind of laments over that in a way, you know, because her mom did it for recreation and, and she's okay. But Teresa was a young girl, maybe who was a little more impressionable. And so some of those ideas really took hold too. Um, and she laments that. But again, looking later on in her life, you see how influential they were, though. Like the ideals of adventure, the romance yes. of following Christ no matter what, you know. Um, being willing to go through all these things for, it, for the sake of this love, you know. And yes. so, so that romantic aspect that she kind of laments the way it was maybe she received it, in the end, God used that too to really yes. kind of help forge her, her spirituality. Yeah, and that's a key takeaway for our own lives, I think, is sometimes we can lament, you know, things of our past, even things that were rather sinful, um, and we're able to see that now. Um, but, but yeah, the way that God can find a way to use those things, even the lessons we learn from them, or, or whatever little thread of good there was mm -hmm. in that, that sin, um, God can find a way to use it for our better in the future. Exactly. Yeah, and the more we know that, I mean, the more healing I think we can we can come to for, through, with our past and yes. reconciliation with our past, because yes. we can see... Acceptance, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then returning to the death of her mother then, so this was, you know, a very tragic moment in the life mm -hmm. of the family. Um, the loss, you know, her mother was very young. I think she was, she wasn't even 40, I don't think, when mm -hmm. she died. So like you said, though, she had a, a, gave birth to a lot of children in a short period of time. It was very hard on her physically. Um, and so it sounds like her mother seemed to have died a very, a holy, very holy death in the way that Teresa remembers it anyways. But yeah. Um, that would have major repercussions, of course, for the family moving forward. Yeah. Any, I mean, anytime there's like a crisis like that, you know, in your life, especially for the age of, you know, Teresa said she was 12, but really if, you, if she was like 13 or 14, you know, and um, you think in adolescent mode like that, you know, just how much is going on in your life and to lose your mom, someone who's your confidant too. And not only was she her confidant, but Teresa was her confidant, mm. you know, like her mom really loved her because she could really, you know, she saw her almost like a peer mm. and that's is interesting. And so, when you know you're, you know, someone sees you that way, it's like you receive a lot from that too, you know, and, and a lot of support from that. So, so she, yeah, with her mom's passing, it, it, it just threw everything probably, you know, everything that she knew before and her, just her way of life and her routine, you know, everything's all of a sudden just kind of shattered in a sense. Yeah. Um, but, but because of that love for Our Lady, there was a saving grace yes. in, in that moment. Yeah, exactly. So then because, you know, it, it makes sense that it was through Teresa's mother that she came to this devotion of, of Our Lady. And so at the passing of her mother, she was able really to turn to Our Lady um, and, and you know, commit herself to, to Our Lady as her daughter mm -hmm. and uh, seeing Our Lady as her mother. Yeah. And, and some will say it was like a, a true consecration. You know, Teresa goes and, and goes to the statue of Our Lady of Charity um, in, in San Lorenzo Church, I believe, in Avila. And 
and says, you, you, like, I am yours now. Like, you will have to be my mother, mm-hmm. you know? And it, so really a, a, a real gift of self to Mary and a real total dependence on Our Lady as well to mm-hmm. be her mother. Um, and you see this with several of our saints, right? Yeah. I mean, this, this sense of when you lose someone so close to you that, that Our Lady can really be there mm-hmm. as, as a real support, you know? And, and how, yeah, how important that is to know that, that she, she can take, she can, I mean, doesn't take the place in the same way, but she is our spiritual mother and will lead us to Jesus mm-hmm. and we'll make sure we get there. And, and so Teresa kind of had that instinct, I guess you could say, right away to go to Mary for that. Yeah, yeah, and that would, of course, play a very significant role in her life leading forward, mm-hmm. um, especially when, when she becomes a Carmelite. But um, at this time, you know, so now she's at home with her, uh, her, her family without her mother, though, and uh, her father, I, I would imagine, is feeling a little bit more pressure of, you know, raising the kids mm-hmm. and taking care of them with the, the mother away. And so, um, I don't know, Teresa, again, at that adolescent stage and, and is maybe starting to stray a little bit or wander a little bit uh, and, and find some trouble now. Yeah, yeah. well, and this is, this is, you know, again, it's like she made this consecration of Mary, think, okay, everything's going to be good now. But, um, but no, she had to go through a lot. And one of the, one of the hard things, I guess, her, apparently her, um, her dad was really careful about who to let in the home. Really, both her mom and dad were, you know, and they didn't let a lot of influences come. But her, da- her dad's sister had children who they couldn't, like, keep out in a sense, you know, because right. it's family. It's yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> so, so what are you going to do? Yes. And, and so some of her cousins, you know, end up becoming Teresa's, like, main confidants, you know. And, and Teresa was very vivacious. She was very popular. Everyone wanted to be around her, you know. And so probably some of the older cousins really took to her. And, and then introduced her to things that she were, were not the best for her. And mm-hmm. she can really see, you know, the, the, the harm that it did her, you yes. know, to the, just what they talked about, their, their interests. Yes. And, and very quickly, she moved from that kind of childhood piety to a, I guess you could say, just like a more worldly sense or a, more desires for the, mm-hmm. for, you know, what, what te- I mean, normal teenage things in a sense. Right. But, but it was a real shift for her to like kind of now be so focused in this direction. Mm-hmm. And one thing that we'll talk about, I think, in future episodes is how relationship was so central for Teresa throughout her entire life. Friendship and relationship uh, were so central for her. And I think maybe because of her personality, but she was, um, she, she, she put a lot of value in, in friendships and, but it was also influenced a lot. And so she writes a lot about good friendships and bad friendships and then, you know, how they can lead us to, um, or from relationship or friendship with Jesus. Mm. And so here, you know, we have, Teresa's a little bit vague in her own writing about like what exactly was, was um, sinful or wrong perhaps or, or not great about these friendships. But um, there's, you know, you can kind of fill in some of the gaps as far as, well, what are the types of things that, you know, young teenagers start, start to talk about in general and maybe just like a little more gossipy and I don't know, a little more focused on, you know, the self or on other people. And so mm-hmm. again, you don't really, we don't know exactly what's going on there, but um, there's a, definitely a movement away from that, that childhood piety and innocence yeah. yes. because of the influence of these, these cousins. Yes. And, and to the point, you know, where Ter- Teresa says that her, her family was, um, was fearful of her honor, mm-hmm. you know, because of these relationships. Um, and her older sister kind of acted as a surrogate mom in some way, taking care of her. But then her older sister goes and gets married. So yeah. she doesn't have that kind of like keeping vigil over her, you know, but, but her dad was worried. Her family was worried about her, you know, yeah. because of these friendships. So it was strong enough. Mm-hmm. But like you said, Teresa, was, she, she's purposely vague, mm-hmm. you know, not giving all the details. Um, but it looks like probably a lot has to do with romance too, you yeah. know, maybe a, a romance her cousin was in that she's kind of like a partner in crime, mm-hmm. um, but also perhaps a romance for Teresa herself, you mm-hmm. know, that becomes like a real central part of what they're talking about and getting all into and trying to sneak around, pass notes, you know, yeah. things like that. Right, right. And so, I mean, the reaction of, of Teresa's father, again, he's seeing all this unfold. And so um, without, without his wife there to help um, in, the, in the household, he decides that he's going to send Teresa off to, to a school yeah. to, where she'll be guarded and watched and <laughs> formed in the faith. So he, uh, he sends her off to the Augustinians. Yes, and that was, a, it was another crisis for her, you know, mm-hmm. because 
she her, her relationships were so important and in you know, she even says like when she knew someone liked her, she would just, she couldn't stop thinking about that person. She was very attached in a way to her own ability to please other people, you know? And so she, she has these relationships and all of a sudden that all changes, you know, mm-hmm. her dad's scared. She just goes to the Augustinian nuns. Um, and she said it was so hard for her those first few days, yeah. you know, it was like a withdrawal, you know, from, yes. from everything she was doing before. And, mm-hmm. and, and they lived a very austere life in that convent, right. You know, and, and they had girl boarders, you know, who are just, you know, regular girls be prepared for marriage perhaps, but but they kind of lived that austerity and mm-hmm. just total separation from all those influences. Yeah. You know, a couple of times um, this past year, I've gone over to Kenya, to our mission in Kenya, and they have a lot of these boarding schools there. And so I'd stop in and see some of the schools and it helped kind of to, I guess I'd never seen anything like that here in mm-hmm. our country, but it was interesting to see, you know, you have all, you know, hundreds of kids in these schools, but they're all, they're, they're young kids, but they're seated so proper. Mm-hmm. They're so quiet and well-behaved. I mean, it's everything so regimented and, and disciplined. And the time from the time they wake up until the time they go to bed, it's all very structured. I mean, there's yeah. time for play and, of course, too. But, um, but yeah, I imagine that this was somewhat of the, the lifestyle that Teresa was living now. So she went probably from having some freedoms mm-hmm. um, and, you know, choosing where she, what she wanted to do or who she wanted to spend time with. And suddenly it's like things are going to be much more ordered and structured and her, yeah. some of her freedoms are taken away. Exactly. And you think if she did have, if she was in some kind of relationship, you know, or, or had that as part of her life, um, or someone that she had, you know, was fallen in love with in some way, um, think at the height of that, you know, all of a sudden she's ripped away from that. Yeah. And, and, you know, as a 16 year old girl, mm-hmm. um, and you had, she even mentions how people would still kind of pass notes to her, you know? Mm-hmm. So she might've had these like brief encounters perhaps like at the beginning where of like a note or like a, a quick conversation or something, and it would just reignite everything, you yeah. know? So she couldn't like, she couldn't really get over it in a way because, you know, she was still having these, these influences from outside until she, she herself, like it just stopped. And, and it's the nature of teenagers too. They might've just gotten bored and yes. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't keep going to the school and try to get in touch with her, you know, but, right. um, but it, but it, regardless, it was, it made it very difficult, you know, for her to just kind of keep moving forward. Yeah. But eventually, you know, Teresa came to accept and, um, I mean, she still struggled there at the, the convent school, but I, it was in particular because of one of the nuns that really kind of took her, took Teresa under her wing, mm-hmm. that Teresa was, um, I don't know, brought some peace, some peace perhaps in that place, but also a, a, a deeper awareness of her need to kind of reorient her life, I think. Yeah, well, and it shows too, like even the, the regimentedness, um, the separation, like all that was very important to, to help her kind of, but it wasn't enough. Like that's not enough to like change her or to make mm-hmm. her seek virtue. She could have done it. You know, she had a strong will and was, you know, very, very uh, hardy person. She could have gone through it, but it was this nun who was such a good example and really who loved them, you know, mm-hmm. and, and she, she lived with the boarders, you know, so she was one that was always available to them, talked to them. And it said that they would, her name was Sister um, Maria Briseña. And it was said that when they would wake up, in the middle of the night, let's say, they'd see her praying, you know, and, and she, so she really had this deep relationship with God and she was very kind about it and, and just shared that, you know, communicated to that. So mm-hmm. Teresa talking to her, all of a sudden she, she, something reignites in her, like yeah. this, this beauty, this adventure mm-hmm. that I seek, like, like it's maybe possible in another way. Yeah. I like in Teresa's own words when she's talking about that reality, it's almost, uh, she says, she says something along the lines of, I realize that like, entering a convent wouldn't be so bad or something like that. It's like a very, she kind of cushions it still. It's like not, that's not necessarily the life that she wanted, but she like realized like, oh, it wouldn't be the wor- end of the world if yeah. I, if this were my calling in life. Yes, it was, yeah, it was definitely a process for her. Like she, she, well, it shows too, maybe that sense of vocation was so deep that she, to even admit that, like, okay, well, maybe I could be a nun. Like, yeah. it was like no one was telling her she had to be, you know, but mm-hmm. But there was something, yeah, that was moving her in that direction. But, um, but she was far from, yeah, totally embracing it or saying that, like, oh, for love of the Lord, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this for my spouse. Or, you know, yeah. it, it, uh, she was not there yet. Right. But, but those seeds of virtue had been awakened. Mm-hmm. And, um, and she saw that, like, living this way would not be, yeah, would not be a miserable, didn't have to be miserable. Yeah. Well, we know she, I mean, she wasn't at the school for very long. And that was something that struck me in the, rereading this past time I I had forgotten how short she was there. I mean, she was only there for like a year or a year and a half or something. Yeah. It was a very short period of time, but it was very influential. Mm-hmm. And it just shows how, um, yeah, especially through 
important friendships or role models, how quickly our lives can, can really take a turn for the better. Yes. Well, and, and like you said, with the friendship, how that was important to her, and you could see how it, her, her attachment to her relationships, perhaps when she was younger, um, kind of was leading her down a bad road. But now that same kind of like genius she had for friendship and relationship was now, you could see how God was using that to, mm-hmm. to lead her up, you know? So, so with our gifts, let's say, or different, you know, our gifts can also have their shadow side, of course, um, but how God is using that, you know? Yeah. And, and in the end, that was one of like, that's one of the most important aspects of her spirituality was that, that capacity. And, and so now you can see how, yeah, God was using this relationship to bring her mm-hmm. out of where she was before. Yeah, and it seems like, I mean, this is maybe a, a modern way to view that time period, but it seems like by the time she left there, she was very mature. Mm. It's like a, there was a deep maturation process that happened in that year, year and a half, and she left with kind of a different orientation towards the rest of her life. Yes. Again, still str- there's still many more struggles to come, um, and it's going to be a battle. But, uh, yeah, she had just a different – she seems more like, like a young woman now mm. and less like a, a teenage girl. Yep. Um, but yeah, so she has to leave the, the school, um, again, fairly quickly because really, I think because of illness yeah. is her health is just not good and it's, it's hard for her to keep up with the regimented life there. Mm-hmm. And they say part of it was these, these kind of emotional jarrings that she experienced through having to leave home and go to the school and everything like that. It took a toll on her physically, you know, mm-hmm. she was able to kind of push through things, but her emotional life, affective life was so strong that those kind of like breaks you know, really had an impact on her physically. And, yeah. and, and it's good for us to keep that in mind too. Like we, we sometimes forget like the, like the spirit body connection and just how, mm-hmm. how when we do have these like traumatic events or crises, it, it affects us, yeah. you know, and, and we have to take that into account how it might affect us and almost be patient with ourselves yes. to go through things, you know? When, yeah. Right. Give it, give our, give our bodies time to, <laughs> to mourn something or to process something as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so Teresa leaves the, the convent, you know, she's, she's sickly. Um, but shortly after that, she has a very important encounter with um, an uncle of hers. Yes. Yeah. Um, he was a, a widowed man who had his own kind of conversion, you know, later in life, or at least deepening of his faith. And he loved good books, you know, and so he had um, the confessions, he had uh, the letters of St. Jerome, you know, all these books that um, when Teresa came again, cause Teresa was so kind of so likable and, and he took to her right away. And I think, and I, I wonder if he was trying to kind of like, like do his own sort of way of evangel- evangelizing her without her knowing in a sense, because he said, Oh, can you read to me mm-hmm. the letters of St. Jerome? You know, I'd really like to hear you read them. And yeah. she had no desire to read them, <laughs> but, but she wanted to please her uncle. And so it was through reading that, that more and more that sense of a vocation, you know, became stronger in her life. So, so it was a very providential moment to leave the school and then visit her uncle, mm-hmm. um, where she encounters, you know, for the first time, some of these like spiritual classics that really nourished her and, and confirmed some of her own experience. And it almost seems to be a reawakening of some of those desires she felt when she was young. Mm-hmm. Um, but now again, she's like mature enough to, uh, to, to, discern like, well, what is that? What does this actually mean from the direction of my life now? Mm-hmm. And so that, that plays a very big impact on, you know, her, her future and the direction she's going. Yes. And it almost seems like she has this sense of like, still the vocation is like, oh man, like I, I'm going to do this, but it's going to be hard, mm-hmm. but I'm, I need more courage, you know? And so she still has this almost, I guess she's like fear factor in a sense towards her vocation. Um, and even like the letters of St. Jerome, they're very intense of like, there's a quote about how like, you know, if your mother and your father and all your loved ones are like throwing themselves in front of you before to go to monastery, you just walk right over them, you know, or something. And it's like, so you knew that probably hit her to the heart because she loved her parents, she loved her father, her, her family, but she was, yeah, she just knew that this was going to be really hard. Yeah. Um, and, but it gave her, reading that stuff kind of gave her a new strength to be willing to do what it takes yeah. to follow that path. Well, and then it seems like the final step that kind of pushed her over the edge was actually another tragedy yeah. um, because her brother, you know, Rodrigo had gone off to the new world. Her way of interpreting it was kind of like, oh, he fulfilled that, that, that dream that I had to go off and be martyred. Yes. That's a, that's a really good point. That's not always brought out. I think that um, her closeness with that brother and their, that desire for martyrdom was always there, even though, you know, after all they passed through. Yes. And so she interpreted him going to the, yeah, to America mm-hmm. as, 
as really a journey towards martyrdom yeah. and that he was willing to do that. And he saw it, framed it in that way too. Yes. So, so then for her, it's like, well, what's my version of this now? Yeah. You know, what, what, what he did, like, how can I do that? Right. And that this would be the, the outlet for that. Yes. Yeah. And so she decides, I guess, finally that she's, she's going, she's determined, she's going to enter religious life. She's going to enter a convent, but she doesn't quite know where mm -hmm. yet. She's kind of looking around at the different orders. You know, of course, she liked the Augustinians because she knew the, the one sister who had such an impact on her, but she decides the Augustinians are too strict. <laughs> like, that's not what she's looking for. So she's kind of, she's, she's discerning in, in a very, I mean, a natural sort of worldly almost sort of way, um, which God works through those means at times. And so there's something in a natural sense that attracts her about the Carmelites. And it's really the fact that she has a friend who's a Carmelite. So um, there's, there's a natural draw to, to enter there. Yes. And it shows, yeah, our motives maybe aren't always the most pure, let's say, or, but, but that goodness that's there. And, and for her too, it was, you could still see this sense of like, all right, well, what's the least I can do in order to like not have to, um, well, for one, to be saved, to not go to hell. And she would even say, if I died now, maybe I'd go to hell. So that was one of the things, but then the fear of purgatory too. It's like, well, if I can just be a nun for all these, you know, however long I live, 40 years, let's say, mm -hmm. um, then maybe I won't have to do any purgatory. And mm -hmm. so it's like better to do it here than there. And since we're all going to eternity, eternity is all that matters anyways. Like what's, what's the way? way? But, but again, that maybe you could say that love or at least that sensible love or whatever hadn't quite blossomed in her to say like, this is for love of God or to unite myself to Jesus, you know? Yeah. Um, so then she's kind of, look, yeah, where's the best place where I can kind of just do this and, um, and sort of get by and then go to heaven? It's funny though, because I find, I mean, I see myself doing this in my spiritual life sometimes too. It's like, I, I know that this is the right thing, but I don't really feel drawn <laughs> to it right now. But it's like, you know, just in it, almost fake it till you make it. It's like, no, I'm going to do the best that I can to do this and like trust that God is working and yeah. he'll bring about conversion of, of my heart um, as he did in Teresa's heart too. Yes. And she even, she even says that when she's giving counsel to her nuns, she uses that same kind of language of like, fake it till you make it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that was the, I think it was in Spanish. I don't know the translation, yeah, you know, yeah. um, no, but, uh, but, um, but she would say like, when something's really, really hard, like you just do it and then it comes. Like it does, it, yeah. like it will come. It's yeah. those first steps that are so hard, you know? But, um, but yeah, that was, I think her real sense. She would use that later on, of course, you think with her foundations, these very difficult tasks she was gonna have to do. Yeah. But, but God does provide, you mm -hmm. know, and he does, he does make it work. Yes. Um, so you don't always have to wait yet till you're just like so ready and so on fire to do something. It's like, yes. Yeah, like, and this is something I think that is important for, um, our world right now, because it seems, especially young people, there's a real crisis when it comes to commitment, mm. um, because I think there's fear of committing to something. And so um, Teresa shows us that, you know, obviously we have to discern well too, and like seek out spiritual advice and things like that. Um, but there's, there is something to, you don't have absolute certainty and still you can commit to something yes. and say, and, and trust that God's going to carry you through. Yes. And especially those first steps, because God will always kind of give a little more as you go. So yes. by committing to something like Teresa entering religious life, it wasn't like she was taking solemn vows that first day, exactly. you know, it's like, no, she was going, she's going to go to the convent and then you kind of, you know, she just keeps going and then things open up almost themselves, you know, yeah. but, but you still have to make that commitment though, to start right. it. Well, and that's God, I mean, teaching us to rely on him and trust him. And, and if, yeah, faith, faith is meaningless if there's absolute certainty, like there needs to be a, that level of trust yeah. of, of saying, I don't know for sure. And yet I'm willing God to trust you in this, that you're going to keep to walk with me. Yes. Yeah. And the, you could even say like, yeah, the certainty of faith lies in what we believe. Um, but in terms of faith as like an act of clinging to God, an act of moving towards him. Right. Like you don't have all the answers, yes. you know, and, and we don't, yeah, we don't have to wait till we have all the answers. Yeah. We can know God is real. We can know the contents of our faith, but, but sometimes how far that is from us kind of making a choice to trust yes. and to give ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. So then we have Teresa entering then, um, you know, the, the Carmelites there at the incarnation. So again, from, you know, recalling our time that we've spent in Avila, um, the incarnation is, uh, outside of the walls of Avila. So again, Teresa would have been aware of it probably growing up, but it was a fairly good ways from, you know, where she lived. So it wouldn't have been like part of her 
everyday life necessarily, but I'm certainly she would have known about the happenings at the incarnation growing up. And so um, Teresa, you know, w- wants to go off to enter this this convent, and um, she kind of she does it in a pretty dramatic sort of way. <laughs> well, it's it's worthy of those knights' tales that she yeah. the chivalry tales. You know, it's it's um she goes right at the break of dawn while it's still dark outside, and and. Her influence, she takes along another brother who she convinced to to go be a Dominican, mm-hmm. and um, and so they go together, um, and that's a whole other story of like who that brother was or what happened with that, and it's not very clear what happened, but um, but she said it was like all of her bones were dislocating or something, like the 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 pain of leaving her father's house yeah. and knowing that he wouldn't be happy, mm-hmm. um, and she of course she said something and she you know she did what she had to do to get his blessing, but. She, he wasn't he wasn't gonna agree with it you know he and so she just had to go yeah. and then but she knew he was such a good man that he would he would you know be okay with it eventually which he was but but it was so hard for her yeah. to make that step and to yeah and leave in the middle of you know in the at night um in the cold you know and yeah. and and make go that and, long walk over to the incarnation yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well it is i mean it's about 15, what, 15 20 minute walk from from her house so. yes exactly yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can just imagine with each step, just like, you know, wanting to turn around and go back home. Yes. So that was November 2nd, 1527, when when Teresa goes off and enters the incarnation. She's 20 20 years old, so, you know, fairly young woman, but um, going off and and entering the Carmel, the incarnation. What do we know about the the monastery there at that time? It's, It's a fascinating history. The, the, you know, there's a huge volume just on the history of the incarnation, you know, that that goes through its, its beginnings. And it all, you know, it came about basically as like there were a lot of women in Avila um, and in all of Spain, all of Europe, really, but um, who kind of lived Christian lives, kind of consecrated. You know, they didn't get married. They didn't have necessarily their children, um, but they wanted to live almost as like kind of like religious in the world, you know, and it, but they weren't affiliated with a community and they would kind of band together and, and live lives that they were they're called beatas, you know, in Spain. Other places there had different names. And so when um, one of our Carmelite generals, John, Blessed John Soroth, he had the, the foresight to say, like, why not bring some of these women into a community and into Carmelite spirituality and associate them with Carmel? And then it kind of like, yeah, legitimizes their life. It gives them a, a regularity and, and it maybe a, a new fruitfulness, you know, that they can live. And so that wasn't that long before Teresa came around. That's in the f- late 1400s. Um, and so the incarnation was kind of one of these groups. It was a, you know, a widow who helped found it, and she herself became you know, one of the first members. So she was kind of a beata and grew other beatas that came together, and they started this, this way of life and, as a Carmelite. And, but it was a small place, you know, and then and there, originally it was only supposed to be 14 women, right? Mm-hmm. And this is what's so incredible is that um, they ended up you know, moving, but it was still going to be small, and they built, but they couldn't even finish building before they got hundreds. You know, they had a, at yeah. its peak, it was 180 women wow. in this place, you know, that was meant for 14. Um, and of course, you know, they had big dormitories, you know, things like that to like house the women. So it wasn't like, it was just like insanely crowded, but it was crowded and it was, and because of that too, there was a lot of poverty, you know, in terms of, yeah, they took vows of poverty, but also just having enough food to feed 180 people in a community, you know. And at that time, Spain often went through, you know, droughts certain years and there wasn't enough food or the military needed, was taking food, so it was very expensive. And so these women had a hard time even feeding themselves. They always kind of lived like day to day. And and so because of that, a lot of these women would go out and live with their families still so that they could be fed basically and taken care of. Yeah. And so it was a very like loose structure because of that. You were in and out um, and you could, you know, the people who were more wealthy, you know, had more favors because they could help more. And they, and you kind of almost had to take care of yourself if you're living in community, like you'd rely on your own family wealth or benefactors. Mm -hmm. So you could kind of make it. Um, But, but it, I don't want to give too bad of a picture, you know, but because of that, there was a kind of, you know, just, yeah, it wasn't so, it wasn't so, the boundaries weren't all so clear in like what you can do, what you can't do. And, and that made it difficult in some ways, I think, for, for Teresa. I really appreciate how Teresa's able to, when she's commenting on things like this, she's able to point out like the, the, the bad things about the situation, but still say very good things about the people. And so, again, we don't want to give the impression that like these were bad nuns. It was just a, a very like troubling situation that a lot of them were in. But overall, it sounds like they, it was a pretty devout community even. Um, 
more or less. But again, there was some of the, the cultural issues and some of the class systems from the outside of Spain had entered into the monastery and all of that. But um, but when you read about, this is something that Father, again, Father Mark O'Keefe goes into in this book in context, when you read about like the life they were living actually was, you know, a pretty austere life and yeah. a, a life of prayer. And um, so these weren't just like <laughs> lax women that, that Teresa came in to reform. Yes. Um, <laughs> but but really, and it was there that she, she experienced a lot of good, holy friendships again that would help her on her journey. Yes, and, and she received what she needed, you know, because she said, like, even though it's so hard for her to make that first step and to go, within days, she said, she was so happy, mm-hmm. you know, and she, she said, I, I'd be sweeping the corridor and thinking about, like, my former vanities and how much more happy I am doing this mm-hmm. than, than when I was, you know, carried all about my hair and my makeup and, yes. you know, perfume, all these things that she was so caught up in. Um, and so, yeah, so I think she... The monastery gave her what she needed, and the novitiate, you know, that she experienced was very good for her and very forming. So yeah, so so God, everything was there in a way, mm-hmm. even though there were a lot of difficult elements. And you know, another aspect too, some of these women didn't even have vocations. You know, like yeah. some some it's because all the men, a lot of the good men had gone to America. You yeah. know, and so there there weren't husbands available. And so when a family had that had that situation, they would say, okay, well, especially a family of means, well, we're going to put you in the convent then and pay a big dowry, and then the convent will accept you. But they didn't have a vocation, you know, and how yeah. difficult that could make it for them and for others around them. If you're an unhappy religious, you know, it's, it's right. not easy for others around you too. Um, so, so yeah, so she had this, these good elements that were there. She had the struggles, but it's good to know that like, yeah, deep down, like it, it was a holy place. Yeah. And, um, and she would eventually take 30 nuns from the incarnation, you know, f- to, to who would join the reform and she would found other convents of the reform with those nuns. So, right. so these are the nuns, you know, that were formed in that context and that she lived with, but they were also, you know, very fervent. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's good. I think, I, I don't know, one thing that's sticking out to me from this episode, maybe as a sort of practical takeaway is, um, I'm reminded of the scripture verse that says the, the violent bear it away. Mm. Um, and, there's, there's a sense in which, again, I don't want to give the wrong impression here, but there's a sense in which when we know um, what it is that, that God is calling us to do, it's, there's going to be a time of difficulty, and it takes doing some sense of violence to ourself in order to commit mm. and do it and trust that um, God is going to, to help us. And it's going to be so much easier in just a short period of time, perhaps, um, but we have to get through that first that first step. So like, you know, whether it's committing to prayer for the first time, it's like, it seems so hard for me to commit to praying, you know, for five minutes every single day when I'm not doing it right now. But it takes some some violence perhaps to yourself to commit, yeah. but realize that like that struggle, that detachment, um, it, it's going to happen and, and you'll be grateful that you did. Yes. Yes. And I think another takeaway maybe we could say is that how God uses everything you know, mm-hmm. like, like all of our experiences and, and uses them for our good. And especially once we turn to him, they all get turned towards our good. Yes. And even like when we're in an imperfect situation on a religious scale, you know, someone who's maybe a little unhappy with what they see in their community or, or in their family mm-hmm. or their school or their Christian group or you know, their parish or whatever. And you think, oh, if only it could be different, I could do this, then everything would be good. That's like, no, God provides through those things. You, you have everything you need. You yes. know, you really do. And Teresa is a, a great example of that because she, she forged her spirituality in the midst of a, you know, very imperfect situation. And, yeah. and yet God provided everything for her to, to be who she was supposed to be. Yeah. Well, we hope that you'll join us again next week because we're going to see, obviously, the work's not done here. And so Teresa is going to go through a long period of, of difficulty and struggle after this too. And God's going to continue to walk with her and, and lead her. So, um, Please join us again next week and know of our prayers for you. God bless you.